Alrighty, we are moving forward here. We spent a little time in the book of Esther. Um, I think it is a great uh, book. There's some learnings. It's in contrast to Ruth. Um, we don't hear much about God in the book of Esther, just like the song of Solomon. We don't hear a lot about God. But we know God's present and he's there. One of the other reasons why I gravitate towards Esther is... Um, I was studying and I found the word per, uh, uh, the pervin, which is a Jewish holiday that's recognized even today. And what that uh, holiday is, is simply celebrating that they were um, not destroyed by the, the Persians and that Esther saved them and Mordecai became, becomes a, uh, which uh, gets elevated into the kingdom. and. Um, it was at a point where they were really struggling, where they were um, looking to be eradicated by this wicked Haman. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But we know uh, this takes place about 485 B.C. So you, you think about how many times they try to, they being the wicked or the enemy, try to, to um, eradicate Israel or Jewish people. We think of um I think of uh, Hitler and, and, and many others, and all through the Bible, we see examples where they are trying to destroy God's people. Um, Esther, just so you know, is um, really a cousin um, to, or a niece, I should say, because of the father, but he takes him in, takes her in, he raises her, and he, she's kind of like the stepdaughter to him. It was her, his bro I believe his brother's daughter, and he raises her. And, um, and of course, um, at first, uh, Esther, basically, we see a, a plea coming from um, Mordecai. Um, and we'll talk more about why that plea. And essentially, she doesn't say anything. She, she, hold, she holds her, uh, her tongue because she's afraid that she'll be, um, you know, killed if they find out she's a Jew. So we look at uh, one of the key verses we'll talk about will be Esther 4.14. And that basically is, that's a gut, gut moment. That's the point where you've got to make a decision in life. And this and how this works, um, I want to try, try to tie it into what we're doing here uh, or what, the, what, what can be used in today's language and how this could be, uh, can affect. So, um, so the Purim, Purvim, which is a holiday, which is, I just saw on the, um, maybe on this one, but it is a holiday. It's a Jewish holiday. It's usually, um, the uh, I believe, the 14th or 15th or 16th, two days. Essentially, that is the time frame where um, they celebrate. They celebrate this festival because of um, being saved, uh, God's people being saved by the per uh, Persians. And it was Esther who became the became the, um, the the person that saved him and Mordecai her her uncle or stepfather um, was also part of that so they celebrate that even today and it's in the month of March and thus is why I picked uh, Esther so um, I see yeah, uh, the feast of per uh, Purim which is the 12th month they call it Adar the Adar calendar uh, it is the 14th and 15th, I'm sorry. And uh, this can be applied to our own lives, this story. And it's about God's perfect timing and um, how we must trust his plan and have faith. So we know that all, all things work for the good in Romans 8, 28. Um, sometimes you can't see the forest, so you can't see beyond um, or what God sees uh, when you are you have a tree in front of you. And sometimes that is uh, uh, our, our issue. Sometimes we, we, we focus on the right up here when there's a bigger picture. And that's what Romans eight twenty eight talks about, um, you know, for his glory, all things. So um, we need to be intentional uh, and follow and be aligned in God's will. Uh, so um, as she's facing the dangers of this time, um, Esther, you know, essentially is a, a redemption story of God saving his people, redeeming them. 
in a, in a difficult time. And the significance behind that is uh, this Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes through the lineage of, uh, uh, of Esther. So um, there is a larger, bigger picture here of this story that will unfold. It's a wonderful story. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed writing on it and um, looking at it, uh, looking at uh, the fact that our faith is essential. Um, but as uh, we think sometimes throughout life, we face these crises, right? Sometimes uh, the problems are severe, threatening the stability um, and the security in our own life. So we have times when we go through these storms. Um, and other times the situations could be critical. Uh, maybe you're in financial difficulty today or bankruptcy. Maybe there's marriage problems. Maybe there's a divorce. Maybe you're having a disobedience or rebellious child, failing grades, unemployment. Well, it goes on and on. Um, maybe maybe you uh, experienced a rape or know somebody or there's a severe disease or a health issue um, or an accident that happened, terminal illness, a death. Um, sometimes we, uh, we stand in desperate need of help, don't we? So in this presentation, uh, we look. We know that they that, that when they were captured, Israel was captured and brought to uh, the Babylonian, uh, uh, well, the Persian Medes, and I'll show you that um, in a minute. But um, there was 15 million Jews that were taken to Persia, uh, to the Persian Empire, um, and they were facing a big crisis in their life. Think about it; they were uprooted. So there was a degree, degree uh, a decree, degree, excuse me of extermination that was issued, and uh, it was looking to wipe out the whole entire uh, race of Jews, and they were on track. That meant every woman, every uh, man, every child, didn't matter who it was, um, they were going to be disposed of, um, even babies. So this decree was uh, a wickedness, um, and Haman is the guy that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to give you a little story on, on him as we get into this. So. The Jews desperately needed uh, some help. So they get help um, um, with Esther and with Mordecai. Essentially, God uses these two um, for his very purpose. Um, and we see this as uh, King Xerxes um, basically makes her, makes her his wife. Um, and she, she's in the palace. And... Um, and why the book of uh, Esther includes the script, uh, including the scripture, um, one was, uh, we talked about earlier, the Feast of Pur Purim, which is present today. It's their joyful celebration. It's a feast at Mar in March that marks this uh, day of being uh, redeemed and through God and Esther and God using her. book reminds us of uh, God that uh, takes care of his people, Israel and all his people. It also shows us his promise to Abraham. We saw, we see in uh, Genesis 12, uh, 1 through 3, um, and as a result, every enemy um, of the Israel and Jewish nations have been defeated. And this is basically the story here um, of Esther, who, who basically I looked at too desperate. So let me just give you some feedback here. So, you may see this, so we're going to talk about, let's move this down here, yeah, Susa. So Susa is the capital right here. Susa is the capital. This is the Tigris and Re Euphrates River. I fought out here. This I'm going to just kind of go through here. Um, I fought on, on, on this side or in between all the way down to the Persian Gulf um, when I was over there. But in 637... Um, you could see the line here, the lineage here, what he owns. So uh, he rules, uh, um, Xerxes rules 127 providences. And it's all the way from India, all the way over here. And then it goes all the way uh, uh, to Persia. And there's seven princesses. So if you can think of it as a country, and the seven princesses would be like seven governors. and um, the person, um, Xerxes, um, the son 
of Xerxes. He is the one that will marry um, uh, Esther. So um, just kind of a little little piece of Mediterranean right here. This is where Jerusalem is. You can see where I'm going here. This is all desert. This is the Red Sea that was parted. This is down here is where they were uh, 40 in the, in, the, in the wilderness. Mount Sinai is down here. You really can't see it. But, you know, the Medo-Persian Empire, or the Medes and Pers, that's, uh, Pers Persians, is how they got their name. Um, and it goes all the way up here into Turkey um, and, and keeps on going. So it's, it's a large swath. So the timeline, um, Xerxes becomes king at 486. Bashiti, or Shiti, uh, she's disposed. Essentially, she doesn't want anything to do with, and, and notice the progression is eight, uh, 486 BC, 483, and it's going, that goes all the way to zero, and then we start the AD, uh, 1 AD, 2 AD. So we're working backwards, if you will. So you can see, so the first queen is disposed. She wants nothing to do with it. Everybody, they send, uh, what, 9 to 12 um, people or, or other um, women or Persians to try to get her to come out and come see him. He would, she wouldn't do it. So they basically, uh, and he was, he was um, very unsuccessful here in 779. He, um, he was defeated in a major battle, so he was feeling pretty bad. And, eight, and 478, Esther be queen, becomes queen after they recommended him to have a uh, queen in, 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 in uh, uh, you know, in the amongst of them. And then the per, uh, four, uh, 473 is when Purim is established. So this kind of takes us through the timeline here um, and, and kind of brings us to where, um, where we're going next. So um, when we look at, let me see if I can, all right, so I want to read, Let's read right here. Um, I'm going to read to 17 real quick. And then we're going to get into it. I'm going to proof text this. The reason we read it is so you see it, that it's not being written by Dean Alley. This is being written. Everything in the Bible um, is uh, inspired and inspired by God. And um, he is uh, the author. Well, he's the author. And he inspires uh, these uh, individuals to write the 66 books. Um, so um, everything that's in the Bible is everything he wanted to be in. All right, so we're going to start. This is uh, chapter 4. When Mordecai perceived all was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put sackcloth on in ashes. And he went out in the midst of the city, and he cried with a loud, bitter cry. Now, sackcloth was a really rough uh, garment that they wore. It wasn't something you wanted to. They used it when they were um, uh, repenting or they were sad or they were grieving. It was a, a custom that they did. And then the ashes, um, that is usually from a red heifer burned and, uh, entire, uh, entire when it's sprinkled on and unclean and made them uh, ceremonial clean. So they used the ash on their... Uh, Time to start wrapping up your work day and plan for dinner. Sorry about that. All right. So uh, they used the ashes as well. So and it came before the king's and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. So he's mourning. And what, what we find he's mourning is basically the decree that uh, Mordecai has put out to, the, to uh, um, destroy the Jews. Uh, so he comes to the gate and... Um, in every providence, whether so, whithersoever, the king, uh, the king's commandment and his decree came. What we just talked about, eradicating the Jews. There was mourning among the Jews and fasting and weeping and wailing. Many uh, lay in sackcloth and ash. That was the way that they mourned. That was the way um, they prayed and cleansed themselves and came before God uh, in this sense. Um, so, um, so Esther. Esther's maid. Now she's she's now in the in the uh, um, palace, and when they say they came to the gate, I'll show you that in a minute. But uh, Esther's maid in her chamber uh, chamberlains, which typically were eunuchs. Uh, eunuchs were uh, they had they removed their 
uh, usually private parts, so there was no desire um, to cross the line or border or whatever. Um, and um, they did that for to make sure there was nothing hanky panky going on. Okay, so um, so our chamberlain came and told her that essentially Mordecai's out there. He's wailing. He's 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 grieving. The queen she was exceedingly grieved. I mean, this is the guy that raised her, right? And he told her not to tell anybody who she was and not to explain to uh, anybody that she was Jewish because that would have just probably killed, it would have killed, she'd been killed. Um, so she's grieved and she sends Raymond. So she knows he's in sackcloth. She knows he's out in the front of the gate. She knows that she's got to put some clothes on him because that tells everybody that there is, he's a Jew because he's following this procedure of sackcloth and crying out loud, bitter cry. <coughs> so she's trying to give him some clothes. He won't take it and take away the sackcloth from him. So she's trying to get that away to try to change his look so he doesn't look like a Jew to be killed. She's afraid for him. <coughs> then Esther, she calls Hatch. Hatch is one of the Chamberlains um, who he had appointed to attend, up, attend her. So, it's again, it's a eunuch. It's one of her chambermaids or chamberlains um, and, and was there to help him. So, uh, and gave him the command to, uh, to go to Mordecai to know what it is and, what it, and, and why it was. So Hatch went to Mordecai and he went on to uh, the street and of the city, which was before the gate. And Mordecai told him, all that had happened to him, and the sum of money. Now, there's. let me give you some color on this. The money that was put out there for to eradicate was somewhere in uh, the 20 to the, the 25 million um, uh, in today's dollars to eradicate the Jews. So that was given um, to try to get rid of them. So he's telling the story about the money being promised uh, to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to kill them. And that was a large sum. So... Also, he gave him the copy of the, the, the writing of the decree and was given at Shushan to destroy, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go unto the king and make supplication unto him and make this request before uh, him for her people. Now, he's requesting something. She's the queen. She's quiet. She's not telling anybody. She's, she's been very uh, secretive. When it comes to, um, you know, uh, telling anybody about her um, her lineage, basically, and um, you'll see right here. Let's see, let's see, uh, Mordecai. All right, we got that uh, anguish. I got that. Um, okay, intense grief. The law. The law was absolute, right? So this decree. Uh, he's, you know, the eunuch is getting ready. Hatex is going to take that back and, and give her all this information that she didn't know about. Now, you got to remember Mordecai, um, the Jew, um, he is a Benjamite. He is one of the 12, obviously, tribes, but a Benjamite. And, and you know, the Benjamites were uh, a very special and very gifted in battle. Um, and a lot of the Benjamites I've, I've read is they were left handed. Um, so, Interesting about that uh, tribe, um, and basically, um, you know, some more cries out there. He's 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 weeping. Uh, they're mourning um, all of the Jews, really. Um, sackcloths everywhere. It was traditional to express the grief in those sackcloths in the ancient times or the uh, the Near East. Um, despite the emotional turmoil, uh, Mordecai is uh, sure the Jews will survive. This will reflect God's will to protect his people. So right here, you're going to see he's got a little bit of faith. So let's go back to, the, to, to where we are. So Hatch uh, went forth to the king's gate. Mordecai told him all that happened, the money. Um, he talks about um, the copy of the, the decree that was given at Shushan, so that came from the king's palace to destroy him, to show to Esther and declare that they need some help. And Hatch came to... Told and, and told Esther the words of Mordecai. And again, Esther spake to Hatch and gave him a commandment unto Mordecai, all the king's servants and the people 
of the king's providence. Do, no, uh, do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come upon, uh, unto the king in the inner court who is not called, there is one law of him to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out his golden scepter, so um, that he may live. So if you come in front of this Persian king unannounced and not into his chamber, if he doesn't put out his scepter or his, his wand or whatever, they're going to kill you. That's just the law. Um, and she knew that. So she couldn't go in there and talk to him because she was afraid she would be killed, right? So, um, and the fact that she was going to tell him that she needed him to save save his people. So, so despite this, uh, this piece, so, uh, Esther's concern. Um, so again, we saw where she sent him some clothes. Uh, she's distressed over the step, her stepfather. Um, she sent her trusted aide um, uh, to find out what was going on. He's at the palace gate, um, which that's what most people did. They, they came to the gates of, of these, these houses um, when they're, you know, for many things, but um, it's kind of where you get all the information. That makes sense. Kind of like the, the corner convenience store. Everybody kind of knows everybody. Well, that's just the gate's the same thing. So he instructs her to go seek for help and plead mercy. And we see right here, um, she's already saying, hey, I can't go in front of him because I'll be killed. And uh, so she tells, uh, she told the uh, Mordecai, they tell him the uh, Mordecai's Esther's words. Mordecai commands again. Think this is now. This is this is key right here. Then think. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. Think not of thyself. He's saying, don't be thinking about yourself. That you shall escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. So she's a Jew. She can't escape this herself. And for it, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, in other words, if you you stay quiet, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise towards you. Talking about this evilness arising towards the Jew from another place, but you or thou that thy father's house shall be destroyed. Talking about Israel, and who knoweth? This is key right here whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What is he saying? He's saying, you know, God God sets one up, God sets one down. That's how he works. And he's saying, you know what? There's a reason you're in the temple. You're in the palace. You're the wife. You know, God has a purpose. And now is your time uh, for that purpose to stand. You know, you think about us, you know, um, when we're out there talking with people about our faith. Um, and we don't want to say anything because we're ashamed or we're embarrassed or we don't want pushback or whatever. Um, those things happen. So um, this is a great example of here in, 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 in this time. Um, he's basically saying, look, don't, you know, this is the time. You know, God put you in this position, and, 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 and perhaps this is the reason you're in that position. Um, and um, then... Esther bade them return to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews that are present. Um, let's see here, that are present um, in Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink three days, three nights. So they're going to pray. They're going to fast. That's, that's a custom for the Jews. Um, I also, and, the, and my maids will likewise or fast likewise. And so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. That's a big statement. So she's going to say she's going to do it. I'm going to go do this. So Mordecai went his way, and he told all this that Esther had commanded. And essentially said, um, um, in these 17 verses, this little little story transpires. Um, so we talked about you can't go in front of the king, you'll be killed. Um, Esther hasn't seen the king in 30 days. So, you know, is it he's lost, she's lost, he's lost interest. She's got no favor with him. Um, um, <coughs> so that makes it even more scary, right? She doesn't know, she hasn't seen him in a month. And now she's got to go in front of him and tell him. Um, and 
Mordecai insists that she be courageous in this situation. Because uh, being the queen uh, would not protect her where she was a Jew. So even being the queen, you're probably not going to be protected. Uh, so she stayed silent. Um, God would, would have to go raise somebody else, right? So she still needs, she and her family would perish. Everybody would go. If he'd known she was a Jew, he'd have never checked her. He never chose, chose her. So um, because God has raised her for this very purpose, and that's in verse 14. This is, where is that? This is important. Right. All together, you hold your peace. That's now our. This is the verse that I'm bringing to your attention right there. So Esther's uh, she's basically she's uh, courageous um, on this decision. She tells them what to do. Um, she would then disobey the law and go to the king. So she's planning to go to the king. Could be her life, and and she says it down here. Um, if I perish, I perish. Isn't that powerful? She's willing to go and put her life on the line for her people. How about us? We willing to put our uh, self out there? We willing to put ourselves on the line for somebody? Another Christian stand up for somebody? So, so as she approaches, um, Esther's forbidden to approach the king. Um, I'm going to slide over to this one. Um, it came to pass on the third day. Remember, she told him to pray and fast for three days. She put on her royal apparel, so she's going to look good, um, and stood in the inner court of the king, king's house over the king, against the king, and the king sat up, his, sat up on his throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house, and it was so that King saw Esther, the queen, standing in the court, that she had obtained favor in his sight. So she, he's not, he's, he's already, it's a positive. Then the king held out Esther, the golden scepter. Remember I said he has to hold that out to, to keep him from not being killed? So Esther drew near and touched the top of the spear. Then the king said, and what wilt thou, Queen Esther, uh, what do you want? What do you want in request? Uh, it shall be given to you to half of the kingdom. So he's willing to give her everything, right? Um, so she's in front of him. Uh, he, saw, he sees her. He's pleased, right? Uh, he, holds out, he holds out his scepter, which is a parting, a kind of pardoned her. Um, he asks her, what do you want? I'll give you anything. I'll give you half of what I have. Uh, he assures her that she could have whatever she wanted. And her request, let's see what she requests. And she answers, if it seemed good unto the king, let the king of Haman, and Haman, she brings Haman in. Um, and Haman is like the lieutenant governor, second in charge. So Haman, who's wicked, uh, uh, come, uh, come this day to the banquet. So she's going to prepare a banquet for these two people, uh, the king and Haman. The king says, cause Haman to make haste. Tells Haman, you know, go tell Haman, um, hurry up, that this, uh, that he may do as Esther has said. So we're, he hath said. So King Haman and uh, King and Haman came to the banquet. Esther appeared, and the king again um, asks Esther at, at the banquet of the wine, uh, "What the, what is thy position? What do you what is your position uh, petition? It is to be granted, and it will be granted basically. And what is your what is thy request? Even to half the kingdom, it will it shall be performed." And then Esther said, "My petition, my request." If I have found favor in the king, if it please the king to grant petition he, to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to a banquet that I shall prepare for them and will do on the morrow. So she's saying, let's go the next day, come to my banquet again. They're sitting back, they're relaxing, you know. Uh, think about Haman. Haman's thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm being invited with the king and I'm being treated. So that means she has total respect for me. He said, that's pride, folks. That's pride. So he's got a little pride going there. So uh, he's surprised, but uh, uh, essentially she asked to, to attend the banquet again, as we see it the next day. Um, and then she'd make her 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 her, um, her request known. Um, so when facing a difficult 
um, uh, circumstances, uh, we must turn uh, to the Lord. We must put our trust into Him. Often, um, there's no help available other than the Lord. There's no other available help in those times uh, we need to call on Him. Uh, the Lord's always available, and uh, no matter how dire the situation is, um, God loves us, and He longs to help. He wants us. He wants that relationship. Listen to what He says here. So in difficult circumstances, we could trust the Lord, the Lord for guidance. Psalms 25, 9, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek he will teach his way. Psalms 27, 11, teach me thy way, O Lord, and teach me in a plain path because of my enemies. Teach me, show me, lead my path. For God, this is, for this is God, is our God forever and forever. He will guide us even unto death. So 48, 14, he's going to be with you right to the end of death. You shall, or thou shalt guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. He will walk with you. He'll, he'll, he'll protect you. He, he, he is going to be there for you. Um, one of the things I mentioned earlier about Haman, here's a picture of Haman. Everybody in the palace were, was bowing down to Haman. As you can see, he's being... This is the gate. He's being, and he looks over and he sees Mordecai. Notice Mordecai's not bowing. That infuriated him. That's why the decree was made to kill the uh, the Jews. Um, but I will say this. If we go, let me, let me explain. Why does Haman hate Mordecai? Obviously, he doesn't bow to him or respect him. But what is the what's the root cause? So if we go to let me go here. I'm gonna pull up um, First Samuel, First Samuel 15. One second, bear with me. I want to go to my computer slow. First Samuel fifteen thirty-three. And you say you say, Dean, what's the deal with this? What's the deal with this chaplain? What are you what are you trying to show me? Thirty-three. Look at this. All right. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women children childless, and so the mother uh, be childless among children. And the Samuel hewed Ag Agig in pieces before the Lord. So uh, before the Lord in Gilgad. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, an Agagite, okay, um, an Agagite we know is um, part of the Amaleks. Back in Samuel's day, uh, they were told to go in there and wipe them out. So Samuel goes in there, he wipes them all out. But he doesn't kill the king. Uh, the Agagite king, and um, we know that, uh, let me see if I can pull that up here. Ooh, bear with me here. So, Mordecai, let's see if I can find it. Oh, it's kind of, bear with me. But basically, um uh, We read prior to that, we, uh, 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 you know, eventually we find out, um, you know, that he is an Agagite, Ag Agagite. Um, and it says it, let's see, uh, I might not be able to find it, but anyways, uh, Agagite um, was the king. Agagite was the king of the Amaleks that were wiped out. So when Samuel went in and destroyed them, as God commanded, uh, they were killing people. They were bad people. And um, they were killing their own kids. And God had enough. Um, you know, and, all right, we run nothing. Okay, Esther, turn your uncle more kind of came to came the king. She required nothing but what Agagai's king chamber. This is him right here. Agai. That's uh, Agai. So Agai is... Um, 
is the Amalites. So that's the Amalites. Okay. I don't know why I did that, huh? All right, here we go. What did Samuel do? Samuel kept the king. He was an Agagite. He was Aga, King Agagite in, 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 in the Amalekites. He took him and he cut him in pieces. He literally hewed him, it says in the Bible. He hewed this king. Well, guess who's from that lineage and that tribe of the Amalekites? This guy right here, Moab, Haman. Now, you want to know why he hated the Jews? There you have it. I just laid it out. Because he knew exactly um, what had happened in the past. So we talked about what God will do in difficult circumstances. We trust the Lord. It says here in Luke 21, 18, but there shall be, there shall not be, or shall not a hair on your head perish. The Lord says in Exodus 14, Lord shall fight for you, and he shall fight, you shall hold your peace. In difficult times, um, it's important that we need to understand that these circumstances, we want to trust God. We need to trust, trust the Lord for the strength. It says here in uh, uh, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, let your conversation or conduct, conversation is your conduct and behavior, be without covetousness um, and content. Be content with such things that you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake you. So he's going to provide for you. Um, so that we may, be, we may boldly say to the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear um, until... Um, Fear what man shall do to me, basically. I am poor and needy. The Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make not, no tarry. That's in Psalms 40, 17. Um, and Daniel 2.20 says, um, and answer and said, Blessed be the name of God forever in the wisdom. Um, and might is all him. That's in Daniel uh, 2.20. So um, the story and I'm not going to be able to, to go in this session, but I, I, I'll i give you just a quick piece here. Um, Haman, uh, he sees him. You see it right here. He sees him at the gate. He did not stand, and he did not move. So in other words, he didn't respect him. He didn't bow down like everybody else. And he was mad. He was angry. And uh, you got ne- uh, and, and, and Haman, who's got faith in God, um, um, refrained himself. He didn't get accepted. He didn't get excited. Um, when he, he came home, he sent, he sent and called for his friends, his wife and his, and Zeris, his wife, Zerish. So basically Haman goes on. He wants to build the gallows. He wants to, uh, kill Mordecai, uh, let there be gallows 50 feet high and Mordecai may be hanged thereon. So, um, that night, uh, the king can't sleep. That's God's restless voice, right? He gets up and he asks right here, he says uh, to Bigtha and Teresh, uh, the two kings, what uh, the chambers or, you know, the eunuchs, uh, the keepers of the door who sought, uh, who sought to lay hands on King Assyria. So there was an attempt on the king's life. And we know, and we know that um, it was Mordecai who warned the king of these two people at the gate that wanted to kill him. Um, so Mordecai then said to the king, uh, the servants ministered unto him, and there is nothing done for him. So there was nothing done. So the king said, who is in the court? Now Haman comes. So at the same time, Haman's coming, and the outward court of the house to speak to him about hanging Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him. So the king, um, king's servant, uh, said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king says, Let him let him come in. So he comes into the court. King says unto him, What shall I do unto the man who king's delights to the order? Now Haman thought in his heart, this is pride, to whom would the king delight to honor more than who? Himself. Aren't we like that? Selfish. So he's thinking of himself, right? He's thinking of himself. So Haman answers the king and says, For the man whom the king delighted to honor. Let the royal apparel be brought out, um, which the king uses to wear, and a horse to be ridden on, and the crown royal to be set on his head. Now, you think it's him. Let 
and let this apparel and the horse deliver to the one hand, uh, to the hand of one of the king's most noble princesses, um, prince, basically, um, that he may array the man with uh, with all whom the king's delights to the order. Basically, give me give me the order. Bring bring him on the horseback. Put him through the street. Proclaim him um, as a great man, and that delighted him. So essentially. Um, Haman took all of the apparel, the horse, um, and arrayed Mordecai uh, and brought him on horseback. Um, that was that was him, and he had a plan. He was going to kill. He was going to hang him. And Haman um, told his wife and all his friends uh, everything that had had, had happened or befallen. Um, then said to the wise people, to, uh, uh, this, "Okay, the Mordecai be the seed of Jews." Uh, before them that begin to basically at fall. So we know that they go into the banquet. Chapter 7 talks about the banquet in the second time. And uh, Esther sees them, asks for favor. What is it that you want? Esther says, um, for we sold. Okay, right here. Then Esther, queen, said, I have found favor in the sight, O Lord, O king, if it please thee, let my life be given uh, me at my petition and request, for we are sold, I the people, to be destroyed and slain. It's talking about Israel. But if we have been sold in bondmen and bondwoman, I have held my tongue, to the enemy cannot contra- contravail the king's damage. Then King Ursi answered unto Esther the queen, Who is he? And where is he that durst presumed in that heart? And Esther said, uh, The adversary and the enemy is the wicked Haman. Haman, there he is. Here's the king. She's at the banquet. She's telling him, this is the guy right here that put the decree out to kill the Jews and was going to pay the $25 million to people to the, basically would take him out. So um, so the king arose from the banquet and the wine, and in his wrath uh, went into the palace garden, and Haman stood there to make a request for his life to the queen uh Esther the queen, he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Then the king returned to the palace garden, placed the banquet of wine, and Haman had fallen, uh, the bed whereon Esther was, and she, he's pleading. Then the king said, "He will, will he force the king, uh, the queen, also before in my, uh, before me in the house?" As the word went out, the king's mouth covered Haman's face, and Harbanon, one of the chamberlains, said before the king. Um, Standeth out in in the house of Haman and the king, hanged them thereon. So they hanged Haman in the gallows and uh, prepared him for Mordecai. So we know Haman gets killed. Um, we know that um, Esther saves him. Chapters nine and ten, I mean, as they go on, they talk about um, Haman gets recognized. He gets pulled into into the palace, he becomes a very, very prominent figure, an individual, um, and the feast of fest, uh, the feast, um, a Purim, is announced, and we talked about that earlier. So I want to finish with a couple thoughts here. So the Jews desperately needed help. Mordecai uh, and his stepdaughter Esther. For this purpose, God raised Esther to sit in the throne of Queen as the queen of King Xerxes. That was in 14. So we must never think that the days of great opportunities are past. Today, God gives uh, his people many exciting opportunities to make up a hedge and stand in the gap. Ezekiel 22, 30 talks about it. If we commit ourselves to him, the Lord, and stand in the gap, when our faith is being trusted, we're in trouble, we're having issues, we're having concerns. It's a bad time. Uh, Things aren't going our way. Um, Stand in the in 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 the presence of the Lord in the gap, and 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 pray to God and um, put your petitions and let it be known. And we need to commit ourselves. So we must ask ourselves: Will I be bold like Esther? Will I say, "And if I perish, I perish"? She was willing to lose her life, to save the people of Israel. Of course, God had a better, bigger plan. He had her where she was supposed to be at that time. Um, Have you ever thought you are where you're supposed to be in your moment of life? 
you ever thought, well, you know, God has a plan, right? He does. You know, he knows you when you were in the womb. He's got a plan for your life. Now, he also gives you the will, the will to make decisions and choices. If he didn't, we'd all be robots, and he'd command us to all love him. That's not how he operates. He's a God of love. So you got to think about that. Um, are you where you're supposed to be in life right now? So God allowed Esther to surrender herself and serve him and his people. She sees the opportunity. I'm going to ask you, how about you? Are you available? Are you willing? If God can use peasants, powerful queens, to accomplish his divine purpose in this world, even today, he can certainly use you and me. God could use you for his purpose. You have to let him. Not only in your church, he can use you. He can use you in your home. He can use you in your neighborhood. He can use you in your place of employment, school. Maybe you're sick, you're in the hospital. He can use you. God can use you to influence others and accomplish his purpose if you're fully committed to him. And we've always heard that we uh, can influence people uh, from our, our positions of just knowing people. So I'm going to close with this. The question is, where do I live and work? The question is not where I live and work, but who do I live and work for? My question to you, is it the Lord Jesus Christ, or am I selfish or and work for me? If you don't have, and if you, so again, this is, you got to make that decision. Who, you, who, it's not where you live, who, where you work, it's who do I live and work for? And I pray that that is Lord Jesus Christ that's in your heart. Um, and it's not a selfish uh, point of view and, um, and, and work for yourself. Um, so as I close up, uh, I would ask that if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, uh, you need to get that settled today. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, little narrative on the uh, story of Esther. It's a great, uh, great story with many, many ramifications of redemption saving his people, uh, showing the faith, showing um, uh, God's sovereignty in, in all these things. Um, there's so many different learning points here. And I thank you for your time, and God bless.